Hey guys, I'm so excited to introduce you to our next guest. His name is Rob Stewart, and he is an absolute genius when it comes to all things skincare and health. And so welcome, Rob. Tell people a little bit about yourself and how you got into everything that you're doing now. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure to chat with you again. Um, we had a lot of fun during the fasting summit, and that went really awesome. Yes. So I appreciate you having me back on. As you said, um, I am pretty much a skin nerd. Um, this is due to the fact that for a pretty solid portion of my life, I was suffering greatly and pretty much covered in eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, rosacea, I had leaky gut, irritable bowel syndrome, serital arthritis. I was an absolute mess. Um, and through my own rabbit hole of research and personal experimentation and simply just not accepting what general doctors and dermatologists were telling me about the ability to heal, um, went on a journey and lo and behold, eight years ago, cured all of my skin issues, started a YouTube channel and kind of the rest is history. Mm, I love it. So let's talk about your personal journey and some of the things that you implemented right away that if you had to go back and look and you said, if I had to give you five tips, like these are my top five things I did right away that really made the biggest impact on my skin? That, that's a great question. And for me, it's a little, little probably different than most because I wouldn't do anything the same the way that I did it. Because um, the way that I did it in the, in the past and the way that worked for me was to be extremely aggressive with very alternative methods. So I was doing long water fast. I was doing a raw vegan diet that was focused mostly on fruit and green juices. Um, I was most likely cleansing and detoxifying my body way too much. Um, but you know, you, you make mistakes, you refine, you learn. So they're, they were priceless for my own growth. But if I had my bank of knowledge and I was still suffering from the things that I was, what I would do right off the bat, the, the first two things that I do with my clients and that I tell everybody is, Number one, figure out a customized diet plan that you can sustain. It's the consistency and the sustainability of your healthy diet that will bring you, in my opinion and experience, the most benefit for the health of your gut and the health of your skin. So that's, that's number one. I did do that, but I took a very long road to doing that. So I would have focused on that first. Secondly, what I've discovered through helping over a thousand people um, I've had a thousand clients, friends um, that I've led through this process. And the, the diet is the main thing. But number two, and this is the most overlooked part is, what are you doing every single day to address the immune and the autonomic nervous system response? So if you're eating perfect food and you're doing a little bit of cleansing and getting your workout on and drinking water and surrounding yourself with wonderful people, those are all wonderful but they only take you so far if you're not addressing the actual system that is out of balance. So what I mean by autonomic nervous system re response or an autom autonomic nervous system protocol, it's breath work, it's cold exposure, it's that thing that will bring you to that edge of being absolutely fearful of doing it. The, the moment before you go into an ice bath, you are your mind is racing. You're looking for any excuse to get out of it. You're, you're, you, you're looking forward to a hot cocoa and a, and a jacuzzi and a warm blanket. Um, but it's that fight or flight and facing that and doing it in a controlled manner and doing it in a way that you can do it on a, a, a consistent, sustainable way that really, again, starts to switch over the immune system. So when you combine the diet and the daily practice of addressing the immune and the autoimmune system, that's where um, I wish I would have focused on right from the start. Now, a few other things that I've already mentioned. Well, I want to talk, I want to ask you about the cold baths because I've yeah. seen pictures of you. Mm -hmm. I've seen you on Facebook. Um, like talk to people if they have never done like, a, I, you know, I know we have our cryotherapy is really big here yep. and we do that. Do you do that at all? Or do you just, I mean, because that's kind of expensive. Do you just go for it? Like now I know you said, did you say you're in Omaha right now or yeah, I'm in Nebraska? Omaha right now. Yep. Yeah. So like when you're there, are you creating your own 
how, like, how does someone do that? Like walk us through the process of doing that. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of different levels. I think the easiest way for a person to kind of get their feet wet, you know, no pun intended is go in your shower. Um, I actually just posted a video about this a couple of days ago on how to take a cold shower the correct way. Um, before you get in the shower, don't, don't go in and make it warm and get all cozy and feeling all good. Go into your shower and reach in, put that sucker as cold as it will go and let it get cold and then submerge yourself fully into that thing. And you'll, you'll get the initial experience. Now, a cold shower is great and you can do that often, but it doesn't really do exactly what, you know, cryotherapy or going into a bucket of water or a, a barrel of water that's got a hundred pounds of ice in it or a frozen lake. Um, the next step I would say for people. Um, well, let me, let me say this. So what are the other benefits? So, cause I de- ideally like the idea of immersing the body in freezing cold water, obviously that speeds up recovery after exercise. It reduces your temperature, it increases blood flow. It helps with inflammation in the tissues and muscles. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, I know when my husband got a vasectomy, a you know, a couple of years ago, he, he'll be so mad at me for telling this, yeah. but anyway, you know, he was like, get me more, more bags of frozen peas. Right. Yep. So it's like, obviously that reduces pain and swelling, you know? So besides just, you know, when you're thinking about that ice bath, besides, you know, inflammation, is that, is that what you're really doing is kind of reducing the inflammation in your entire body? Yeah, I think in a in a certain way that's definitely happening. It it reduces inflammation. It 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 helps with the inflammatory response. But on a on a deeper level, um, it's addressing the fight or flight mechanism in every cell of your body, including your brain, including your emotional centers, uh, your mitochondria. It, it's 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 kind of like this. A uh, tiger's running at you in the wild, and your body is going to go into an altered state. And for most people, it's going to make you do two things, one of two things. You're either going to fight that tiger or you're going to run. Um, And they're both autonomic responses. You you really, in those moments, don't have a choice. Now, every single human being that's alive right now is filled with so much toxic crap, emotional stuff, um, actual toxic stuff from the environment, from food, and our response to normal fight or flight things like fear, um, like maybe uh, a traumatic situation, or maybe it's just our own body's weird immune issue that's, that causes eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, cancer, diabetes. You can start to control that through exposing yourself to the cold. Once you get to the place where that cold starts to be able to, you sit into it, you relax into it, you breathe into it, you can feel the cold, it's there, but you're not freaking out anymore. Then on a huge and deep level, you have kind of mastered what scientists previously thought is unmasterable, uncontrollable. So the theory is, and of course, Wim Hof is the one who has made this most famous, is as you get better at, or you get deeper into the practice of cold exposure, your body, your mind, your emotions start to have a different relationship with the fight or flight mechanism. And as your body has a different response to the fight or flight mechanism, your body becomes extremely virile, extremely healthy, and you can kind of turn it on and off. Hey guys, I don't know about you, but if you are just feeling so tired throughout the day and just feeling restless at night, then I want you to try something called Energy Bits. Each package is has spirulina or chlorella algae. They're plant-based and they have zero sugar, 40 nutrients, five grams of protein. And so you are gonna feel great taking them. So go to energybits.com and then you'll get 20% off if you put the promo code Chantel. That's C H A N T E L. Yeah, and it's I've heard that the vagus nerve is linked with the parasympathetic nervous system, yep. and training it can help you face stressful situations more adequately. And so we're all under such you know stressful situations that it's that's another benefit. Totally, I've I've been told by mentors it's not the stress that messes in messes up anybody; it's our response to the stress mm. that causes all of our issues as a human. You know, this is kind of Zen Buddhist, but as as humans, we're going to suffer. Period. 
you're going to stub your toe. Someone's going to call you a mean name. <laughs> Stuff happens. But we have a choice. You know, how do we respond? Do we respond by getting all huffy and puffy and emotionally disturbed and want to lash out? Or, or, you know, do we hit our toe and freak out and put a bunch of crap on it and make it worse? Or do we just kind of, okay, that I felt that. That was a strange experience. A lot's coming up. But your response is calm. You can deal with it. And, and on, a, on a certain level, it, it becomes the type of thing where you're empowering yourself rather than having that knee-jerk reaction that then causes a lot more suffering on top of all of this. Yeah, I love it. Okay, what's number three? Number three, um, movement, 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 movement. If you're not moving your body, and, and I'm not talking like, oh, I got my 30 minutes of aerobics in, or I, I got a CrossFit workout in. I'm talking... If you study the blue zones, which is, um, you know, the blue, blue zone study studies the longest living societies um, in history. All of them have one thing in common. Um, well, they have several things in common, but one thing that stands out the most is every 20 minutes, they're vigorously moving their body. Um, so on a normal day, a human should basically have eight hours of movement. And I'm, I'm not talking like walking from your desk to the fridge. Um, I'm talking hiking biking, dancing, lovemaking, ball playing, um, workouts, easy workouts, meditation. So upping your movement in a very natural way and doing it outdoors as much as possible is a huge game changer for a lot of people. And, and that kind of piggybacks onto number four is being in nature. Um, you need sunshine, you need fresh air, and you also need the negative ions that things like trees and grass and dirt provide for your body, it actually helps you detox. And number five, I would say would be make the process fun. Um, I white knuckled it in the beginning. I isolated. I, I thought I had to be a yogi and go into my meditative cave and, you know, do all of these kind of like really hard rituals and kind of suffer through the process. And as I broke out of that, and as I started to really heal, I noticed that it coincided with the amount of fun, love, excitement, enjoyment I was experiencing in life. So I started to take an active role in seeking out those friendships and those mentors and the groups and the situations that would excite me, that would make me laugh, that would make me cry, that would make me have people around me who actually saw me, who loved me, and who I felt the same about. And I think that that's a super underestimated um, part of healing your body or healing your brain is who you surround yourself with and what you're doing. You got to make it enjoyable. You got to make it fun. Yeah. Now, what about fasting? I know that you are huge into fasting. Talk a little bit about some of your fasting experiences and what you did. Yeah. So um, fasting for me was something that was just very natural. It felt um, I was called to it on many different levels and I got really into it because I got immediate results from doing it. Um, it was the only thing in the early phases of my skin disease reversal process that brought about noticeable results, both on my skin, in my gut, and just in my whole, whole being. Um, it started off for me as super basic stuff, intermittent dry fasting, intermittent fasting, very short water fast, um, some juice cleansing combined with intermittent fasting. Um, and it kind of led me down the rabbit hole of understanding, okay, this, this could be a major breakthrough for me. And in my, my first year, I call it my healing year. Um, I was water fasting and intermittent fasting on a weekly basis, um, the entire time. So talk a little bit about dry fasting and why is it beneficial and how long did you dry fast for? And if someone's thinking about doing it, what, how would they ease into that? Well, first of all, I think that I want to highlight what you said. And this is the mistake I made with fasting is I didn't ease into anything. I jumped into the deep end with no floaties and just kind of, you know, luckily I had a snorkeling mask and fins on, but um, I, I wrecked myself a lot and didn't really need to. So easing into all of the different fasting approaches is, is paramount with dry fasting I think this is probably the most controversial type of fasting. Um, you have many different um, schools of thought. For me personally, 
I don't ever do dry fasting in the kind of normally promoted way where you say, okay, take 24 hours and don't drink any water, don't eat any foods, completely let your body dry out. Um, reason being is that one, if you've ever had kidney issues and you try that, your body's going to send you a biomarker signal that is obvious. It's going to say, you're killing me, stop. Um, and so for, for in, in that way, I never promote 24 hour dry fasting, but you can use dry fasting and the lack of taking in liquids to kind of do some certain things. The way I normally do it and the way I promote doing it is to drink your normal amount of water during a window. So let's say from mm -hmm. nine in the morning until six o'clock at night, you, you make sure that you got plenty of liquids and water in you. You hydrate the heck out of yourself. You don't overhydrate, but you just, you get what you need to get. Then from maybe six o'clock at night until nine o'clock the next morning, no liquids, no foods that have liquids in them, no foods at all. And so it's kind of an intermittent dry fasting approach. So in my opinion, you kind of get the benefits from dry fasting, plus you're still hydrated from the previous day. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. And, and most of the benefits that I've experienced dry fasting have been similar to the benefits that I've experienced from water fasting and just intermittent fasting. And that's when you give your body a total break from digesting water, food, nutrients, it's going to do other stuff. Most of the time, it's going to go into an autophagy type of state. It's going to start to clean out the cells and turn them over. Um, if you have inf inflammation in certain organs or certain parts of your body, it might zone in on those and, and send some extra help. And it, it does speed up recovery processes um, pretty big time. Most, most people who mess with fasting, dry fasting, see their healing process just kind of kick up a little bit, kick up a gear, maybe speed up just a little bit. And for me personally, um, I try to look at certain things in my body, biomarkers. And what, what do you mean by biomarkers is what people always say. What the heck is that? That's your sleep, your hormones, your sex drive for men, morning woods, um, your creativity, your body fat, your strength, and your just virileness for life. Are you, are you there? Are you energetic? Are you really feeling things? Um, and when I drive fast and I do it right, all of those things in days to come and weeks to come are extremely heightened. Um, and I think that's a kind of a big note for people to kind of key in on. If you're trying things out and the next day or, or, or a week later, your biomarkers are tanking, you got to adjust. You got to do something else. You got to make, make, make something or do something rather that's, that's more beneficial for you as an individual. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, one of the things that is important is that you don't want to have too much water. I think one of the things that people are like, oh, you need to drink water. You need to drink water. You know, people think, oh, I'm fasting. I got to really load up in the water. And I basically just drink water as I'm thirsty. And I agree with you. I'm not a proponent of dry fasting unless you're doing it in a, not a 24 hour dry fast, but I'm a yeah. big proponent of just doing a dry fast during that window. So if you're going to say, okay, I'm going to eat from 12 to six, or I'm going to eat from 12 to eight, I'm just eat, eating and drinking my water during that time. And then dry fasting the rest of that time. I think that does have some benefits. And I think it's, it's a great idea. Totally. Because people don't realize you can, you can overhydrate. You actually drinking too much water, you actually could die. People don't realize that is that drinking too much water, you actually can die. Yeah. It's very, it's very much like a, a yogic Ayurvedic approach. So a little story, when I was a senior in high school, I was a a standout athlete in Southern California. I got a scholarship to play baseball at the University of Utah. Um, sports was my life. And like the third or fourth game in baseball of my senior year, I made a crazy attempt to make it to home plate on a play I shouldn't have tried. And I dove over the catcher and ended up rupturing my right kidney. Um, and it was horrific. I ended up in the ICU. It, it was just, it was just really bad. Ended my kind of ended my baseball career. And one of the things that both doctors and holistic, holistic doctors, and then later on when I started working with Ayurvedic specialists, they all said, you know, stay hydrated, but do not 
overtax your kidneys with too much water. Um, and so I, I agree with you. I think there's a balance for everyone. I, I think that anytime you really go to the extremes with nutrients or food, you, you got to be very careful. So if you're one of those people who thinks that, well, hydration is good, so I'm going to do two gallons of water a day, you, you could be running into some major issues. Um, and vice versa, if you're someone who is just under drinking water or not hydrating yourself day after day after day after day, that one is sneaky. Um, it, will, it, it won't give you any blaring, hey, you're dehydrated, but a lot of your systems will start to kind of gray out and mute down a little bit. So you gotta, everyone's got to find that balance, um, but you've got to be careful on both ends. Hey guys, I want you to know what I've been doing for my health that is absolutely transforming it. I'm taking massive amounts of vitamin C. Now, it's not just the regular vitamin C. This is 100% natural and it only contains natural sources, whole foods like amla berry, camu camu berry, uh, cherry. So it's literally just ground up fruits and massive amounts and it delivers 750% of your daily recommended vitamin C. So I literally double it and I have just seen so many benefits. So go to ChantelRayWay.com slash vitamin C to get yours today. I agree. And and the biggest thing is that it drinking too much water, it ha could have a dangerous drop in blood sodium levels. And right. so basically, you know, you're regulating, you know, if you're having too much too much water, it can happen that you basically out drink what your body can excrete. And right. so you just have to be careful with that as far as uh, over hydrating. Any, any things that you can kind of signs that you can give if somebody is kind of saying on both ends of the spectrum, because it's just got to be balanced. You don't want to have too much water. You don't want to have too little water. What are some signs that maybe people could notice if they're having too much? Mm -hmm. And what are some signs that they're not drinking enough water? Okay, so too much water, um, a pretty straightforward sign is that you are super thirsty, even though you're drinking a ton of water and you're peeing all the time. Humans aren't meant to be peeing every 30 minutes, every hour, every three hours. You know, it's, it's I was at Burning Man in 2009 and I was like, I, I'm going to hydrate because it's going to be hot. So I was, I was doing the gallon and a half, two gallons a day. And I was, my energy, despite eating some food, was just dropping. I mean, it was like, I almost felt like I was having some type of uh, insulin resistance issue, which I had never experienced before. I was only like 29 years old. And I was peeing nonstop and peeing nonstop and drinking more water and peeing nonstop. I'm talking like every 15, 20 minutes. And I was feeling horrible. And a friend at that time grabbed me and she said, dude, you stop drinking water, eat this beef jerky, take this salt tablet, have a couple of blueberries. So I was like, what the hell is that going to do? Well, I did it. And guess what? Boom. An hour later, I felt like I was a rock star, million dollar, just like my brain came back. I felt strong. I felt virile. And I just drank water from that point on at Burning Man. Um, as needed. When I was thirsty, I drank until I was satisfied and, and, I, and I would stop without really being conscious of it. So when your sodium levels and your water levels are in a nice state, you just pee like a normal person and you don't have this ravenous thirst for water. So those are two big signals. You're drinking water, but you're so thirsty um, and you're peeing probably way too much. If you're the type of person that is peeing twice, three times, four times while you sleep, you you're might be way overhydrated. Um, mm -hmm. On the flip side, um, what does the, the signs of dehydration kind of look like or chronic dehydration look like? Dry skin, especially when it comes to like the back of the feet, the calves, top of the hands, when it starts to get that weird crinkly elephant tea, you know, just like I put lotion on, but it's still got a little weirdness there. That, that's, that's a chronic sign. Um, also hunger, you just ate a meal, 45 minutes later, you're kind of like hungry, but you don't know what for, and you're not sure why. I just had a thousand calories, but man, I kind of want something to eat. You'd be surprised what would happen if you took five ounces of water into your system. Um, you wouldn't be hungry anymore. So your, your hunger is a lot of times um, associated with being dehydrated. The other, the other thing is, is what I call true thirst or true hunger 
And this is something that you seldom hear talked about, um, except for in water fasting communities. And you never hear this talked about by in the nutritional world. But hunger, true hunger, doesn't happen in the belly. It's not that gurgling, oh, my, my, my gut biome is ready for me to eat. I'm, I'm feeling hungry in my stomach. When you are ready to come off a water fast, when it's truly time to eat, or when you're actually truly thirsty, it's a weird little sensation that happens right in the throat, right in the back of the throat. It's kind of like a um, desire for lubrication, um, and it's completely not around your stomach or gut. So when you're experiencing true thirst, um, if you start to have that true thirst sensation like many times throughout the day and you're not listening to it, that, that most likely means you're dehydrated as well. Yeah. And I think that if you have low sodium levels, which is going to happen if you're doing extended fasting, you can have symptoms like bloating, headache, brain fog, maybe getting nauseous because the kidneys have limitations on how much water it can excrete at a time. I think I read in an article somewhere that it's like 800 to a thousand milliliters per hour. Mm -hmm. So if you're like every 30 minutes, you're excreting, you're excreting, you're excreting, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. You, you see the people that walk around with the, you know, glass container of water um, and they're constantly drinking it. Or, or if you, you know, the, the common thing is, you know, if you're working out, make sure to stay hydrated. No, working out is a simulation of fight or flight. And when you're fighting a bear for your life, you're not going to be like, oh, hold on, bro. I need to get hydrated real quick and get my you know, levels right. It doesn't happen. So when you simulate fight or flight in a workout, I personally try not to eat, drink any water at all and let the body go through its different processes hormonally um, and figure things out on its own. And, and also, it's kind of like a control mechanism, in my opinion, for people. It's, it's kind of like when they were a baby, they had their whoopee, and now they have their water. Um, and if I just sip my water, then I really don't have to do the hard work needed to transform myself. And so sometimes I tell people, go put your, your baby bottle down and, and get to work. Awesome. Let's talk about a, a mono fruit or a mono food diet. First, to yeah. people who don't have never heard of it, what exactly is it and what's the benefit and have you done it personally and what kind of benefits have you seen? Yeah, so I've done mono meals both with um, kind of vegan protocols, you know, mostly the most popular way to do mono meals is with one single fruit. I've also done mono meals in the carnivore style, eating one type of bioavailable animal fat or animal protein. I'll start with the vegan side. So what, what mono meal is, is it means that you, you usually do it for a day. You don't usually just do it for one meal, but it means you eat one food and that food only for your entire meal or for your entire, entire diet for a chosen period of time. Popular one for people in the vegan community, because it's so simple, is bananas, banana island. You just eat bananas and bananas only. And if you're hungry, the biggest one I've seen lately is apples. I feel like that's the big rage right now yeah. is the, is the apple fruit diet, like mm -hmm. only eating apples, like for the weekend or whatever. Yeah. I'm kind of dating myself. The banana diet was more like back in the 30 bananas a day, 80, 10, 10 days. Um, but you choose one single fruit, be it mangoes, papaya, grapes, you know, there's many different ways to do it. And you, you simply just eat that food and that food only. And it's, it's similar to the desire, not the desire, but what the process is for fasting. Your body gets so adept at eating that food, assimilating it and digesting it, um, that it cuts down on the energy that it's going to put towards digestion, which is the most energy zapping thing besides your brain that your body does is digest food. And as you simplify your diet, it, it allows your gut to not be taking in a bunch of crap. So if all you're eating is mangoes, well, that means you're not eating Wendy's and Pizza Hut and a lot of other things. So you're kind of, you kind of are in the right direction there. Um, but also, it can really, depending on what your goals are, um, and if you're using fruit for mono mills, if your goal is anything besides catabolism and cleansing, then you got to get your mind right. But if your goal is to cleanse, the fruit's going to flush you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help aid the body move things out. You will be pooping and peeing 
more than you normally would. Um, so it, it kind of allows the body to go through many processes. And, and when you do it with plants, you're going to be in a catabolic state, a cleansing, a detoxification state. And so that's, that's kind of most of the time why people will take a vegan approach to mono meals. On, on the other hand, if you're using things like mono meals of steak or mono meals of beef, that can be the absolute opposite. It can simplify the digestion and assimilation to only the nutrients that your body actually needs. The cholesterol, the omega-3s, the omega-6s, the protein, all in the most bioavailable form. So if you're going to do mono meals and you're kind of looking more to nourish and build and give yourself something that will keep you full, but you get kind of the similar autophagy effects and the digestion health effects, um, beef can be a really kind of weird sometimes, but really awesome experience. Generally, what you experience with mono mills is um, your digestion just becomes super simplified. Um, mm -hmm. Loading can be cut down, um, especially compared to fruit, the beef will give you the hugest effects when it comes to mono mills in terms of bloat, gas, digestional issues. You'll be eating I've eaten five pounds of beef in a single day and beef only. I'm talking no salt, no butter, no nothing, just beef. And your stomach doesn't do anything. It doesn't bloat. It doesn't change. It doesn't burp. It doesn't toot. It doesn't do anything. It just, it just takes in those nutrients and uses them. And it's such a simplified diet that your body kind of goes, okay, I can, I can handle this. This, this, is, this is easy. I, this, this I can understand. So it's, it's mostly for people, a digestive protocol and whether you're trying to use it to detox and cleanse and catabolize, or you're using it to nourish and build and go into autophagy states, that's kind of what you, what you have to keep in mind when choosing your food. Hey guys, I have a free smoothie book that has over 20 recipes that are super unique, like broccoli bonanza, great green smoothie, and mojito madness, and so much more. They are really amazing and you're going to love them. And the best part is it's totally free. So go to chantelrayway.com slash free recipe and you'll get the book and tons of other free recipes. Or just look in the show notes and click there. Yeah. And it's kind of the same idea of food combining, right? Like yeah. the idea is that if two foods require different pH levels, the body can't properly digest both at the same time. So people who are big into food combining believe that that helps with proper health and digestion. And it just kind of makes sense if you're just eating that one food. And I think that even, I know for me, that has helped my skin actually when I do that. And you, it doesn't even mean that you have to just do just apples for you know a week or an entire weekend. You could make the decision where you just eat that, that food for that amount of time. And then that your body's able to digest that. Totally. And then you could move on to a different food. And I think people get this idea of like, okay, I just have to eat apples and nothing apples for a, you know three yeah. days straight, which is not necessarily true. No, that's a wonderful point. And, and, and in reality, my current diet, you could say I only eat mono meals. I just do two or three different mono meals per day. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, I might have egg yolks only for breakfast and do a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. That's my whole meal. There's nothing else involved. Mm -hmm. And then at dinner, it might be something like only salmon mm -hmm. for the entire meal. And so those are mm -hmm. mono meals, you know, separated by maybe six to eight hours. And I always, I mean, I, I am the biggest promoter of simplicity within your meals and mm -hmm. variety only over time. Um, when clients come to me and they're like, I eat so clean. I said, well, tell me about, tell me about your breakfast. Well, I take blueberries and bananas and kale and spirulina and all these supplements and hemp powder and I mix it all up and then I drink it real fast. I'm like, oh man, you're, <laughs> you're good on you. Those are great foods on paper, but man, you're, you're really asking your digestion to really solve a puzzle. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like the difference between, I don't know if when you were a kid, you did, we called them phantoms or we call them, we call them tornadoes. And it's when you'd go to the soda fountain and you'd get a little bit of each soda, you know, some grapes, some orange, some root beer, some Coke, some diet Coke, some whatever. And it, you couldn't taste anything. It, what, 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 what the heck am I tasting? What is this? Is this, you, sometimes you get a little root beer flavor, sometimes Dr. Pepper, but your, your mouth was confused. And we, we love that game. 
Now you compare that to if you just go and get the lemonade and then drink the lemonade, you know it's lemonade, you know what to do with it. It's not confusing. And, and really the same process is going on in your gut. Your gut's trying to figure out what do I do with these nutrients? Where do I partition them? What needs to happen? What enzymes need to come into play? And really what to do with it. And if you have confusion in your gut, you know what your gut's going to do? <clears throat> Everything. You're not going to absorb it. It's going to run right through you. And really it's, it's kind of just superfluous at that point. All right. Last thing. Let's just touch on extended fasting. I feel like you are such an expert at that and can give some good advice. So <clears throat> let's say someone wants to do some extended fasting. Their goal, let's say, is to do a five-day or a seven-day fast. Yeah. First, talk about the benefits you've seen and then go into what's a strategy to get there so that they're not going from not ever fasting into moving into, all right, now all of a sudden I'm doing a seven-day fast. Yeah, I think first of all, when you start to get into the fasting protocols, master the half day water fast. I know it sounds simple. Master intermittent fasting. Get comfortable with it. Get to the point where you can go 15, 16 hours without eating any food and then comfortably eating your food and then being cool with that. Or start mastering the one day water fast. If you can get through one day, and you start to build up that tolerance for that, and it starts to be just something meditative and, and fun, then build on that. So start with one day of, of either one, and then build. You know, Do one day, and, and do that for six months, once a week or once a month, and then move on. So it's a very, very slow process, and it's very methodical. Once you've kind of mastered the one-day water fast or, or extended that to two-day water fast, then you can go into that place where, all right, now I'm going to see what my body can handle and see, you know, what I can actually do. And I, I think for a lot of people, and for me, especially the, the first day is the hardest. Um, the second day is a little easier. The third day starts to be a whole different type of thing. And then by day four or five, you're kind of in an altered state and it becomes, I'm not going to say easy, but it becomes just different. The desire for food, the want for calories, um, it dissipates and mm. the ketones start to kick in and you can kind of get a little bit of a natural high from that and a natural, uh, things are just pleasant and good. And so you just got to take it slow and master the one or two day cleanse. And then I think the most important thing is just don't stay in it too long. Don't, don't be a person that's trying to have an egoic water fast, you know, listen to your body. When it's time to stop, when it's time to break the fast, do it and don't feel bad. If your goal is 10 days and you get to day four, okay, stop. Stop at day four. Look at journal, read your journal, figure out the mechanisms that were working for you, refine. Also, the biggest water fasting tip I have is schedule every moment of your day out. In the morning, I'm doing a salt bath. At noon, I'm doing my Kundalini yoga practice. At two o'clock, I'm calling my support system. At four o'clock, I'm watching this hilarious, wonderful movie. At seven o'clock, I'm reading my book. At eight o'clock, I'm doing my meditation before bed. And at nine o'clock, I'm going to bed. Whatever your schedule mm -hmm. is, write it all down and that will help the mind st stop obsessing about calories and wanting to eat. And it will give you a solution-oriented mindset where you can go, okay, I got through, you know, number one, check that off. What's next? Okay, and you're focusing on these things, these rituals that you're going to do. And then these rituals start to be very different. They start to be extremely powerful, extremely fun. Like when I'm on day 15 of a water fast, man, I am so looking forward to that lame documentary that I'm going to watch at two o'clock in the afternoon. Like I'm like, oh, this is going to be so wonderful. I'm so excited. And, and when you get to that place, it's, it's kind of fun. You know, it mm -hmm. truly is. Can be, it can be an enjoyable experience. And I, I want water fasting and fasting and health to not be harsh and hard. I want it to be fun. I want it to be experiential. Uh, and so that's why I always tell people schedule it out, at least have yeah. a plan. Yeah, I agree. And for me, I would say the biggest things that have made a big impact for me, and I, I still consider it a water fast when I do this, but sometimes I'll take like, you know, I'll take a teaspoon of pickle juice 
that gets me through because I'm not, it's not like I'm having pickle juice, pickle juice, pickle juice. I'm having a teaspoon for the day of pickle juice. I'm taking pink Himalayan sea salt, sticking it on my, my, uh, palm and literally licking it. Um, I'll take homemade bone broth and I'll have, I'm not drinking a, a soup. I'm not having like a, a soup full of it. I'm having two tablespoons and it literally revives me. And I just think it's those electrolytes that really kind of do it. And for me, if I take like an electrolyte powder, it's just not the same as if I just take a pink Himalayan sea salt or pickle juice or those kind of things really revive me. And I don't, you don't need a ton. You just need like a teaspoon and you're like a new person, you know? Totally. totally. I think, I think those little fasting tricks are, are awesome and they definitely have their place. I also want to just bring up another point within that. Try both out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Try all the tricks, you know, the, the pickle juice or the Himalayan sea salt, Mm -hmm. whatever, do that, see how it responds, see what it feels like. And then vice versa, spend some time water fasting, straight up water only and absolutely nothing else just so you can feel the difference what does it bring mm-hmm. up for you how does it feel different in your body mm-hmm. it can it can show you certain things and then the tricks can also make the fasting more enjoyable and longer so you kind of be aware understand what you want and pick the right tool for what you're trying Love it. Well, this has been amazing. It's always so much fun to talk with you. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. So um, where I put most of my content is on both YouTube and Instagram. On the Instagram, my handle is Stuart, Rob Stewart, and I'm Scottish. And so my name is spelled S-T-U-A-R-T, not S-T-W, like Rod Stewart. I wish I was (laughs) Rod Stewart, but I'm not. So Stuart, Rob Stewart on the Instagram on the YouTube, it's just youtube.com forward slash uh, C forward slash Rob Stewart, or just look up Rob Stewart eczema. And I have a, a pretty big following in over 800 videos focused on healing. Um, those are the main places. My website with my coaching offerings and my eBooks and all that is holistichealthactivation.com. You can kind of link up to any of those things from going to any of those places. Awesome. Well, this is awesome. Thank you guys for listening and joining in. Stay tuned because we have another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.